And thank you all for being here. It's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> And you are here inside with, with me, so I definitely appreciate it. So I hope it, I don't disappoint you. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm going to be presenting today is a, a number of projects that I have been working for a number of years. Um, and I kind of show some kind of like my trajectory on um, my interest on, on master builders, um, <clears throat> geometry, stereotomy and the treatises or manuscripts. Uh, um, uh, and the, when I was preparing this presentation, does anyone here listen to the Mel Robbins podcast? Do you guys know who Mel Robbins is? Oh, well, do you, Susan? Uh, well, she's, she's a guy, it's kind of someone who talks about how uh, positive thinking in life and, you know, do a, how to be happy and stuff of that nature. <laughs> and he was talking, and this week's podcast was interesting because he was, he apparently, he, she and, and her uh, staff are reading a book on alternate worlds, like there might be other worlds around the universe and how those probably portals or connections with other worlds might exist. And she was talking about how um, we can also think about in our lives how we can have uh, these alternate worlds or alternate, alternate places where she says where we were or have been happy, right? And um, so she goes and, and, and encourages everyone who is listening to their audience to think about if you are in a situation where you are not precisely very comfortable, where you are not precisely doing well, to think about those times when you actually were happy and think about how far you are from it and what is it that is actually um, preventing you from being there again. And as I was preparing this exhibition, I was thinking this is what makes me happy, right? <laughs> this is what the part, this alternate world at this moment that uh, <clears throat> actually is what I'm feeling, I feel really passionate about, what I'm really interested about. And um, so I'm going to be talking about all these projects. Some of these projects are going to be uh, mentioned with more detail, with more precision. And with some of them, I'm just going to go through quickly because of uh, the sake of time. And finally, I'm going to finish with, uh, with the Carpinteria de lo Blanco, the manuscript of Fray Andres de San Miguel. By the way, I have a few manuscripts here. If later, you guys want to look around. Well, these are treatises, stereotomy treatises. This is a really beautiful one. This manuscript of Fray Andres San Miguel, you can see the pages here, and Alonso de Valdelvira, which I will be talking about a lot today, also is here. But this one, the Fray Andres San Miguel, is the one that I'm going to be closing down because it's what I'm thinking about doing as a CAD fellow and where my scholarship is going. So anyway, I'm going to start with Jose Gelabert, a manuscript from 15, 1650, 1652, and the problem of the growing vault. Right? We are in this context of when stone was the, pretty much the main material for building construction. And what the manuscripts usually do is that they try to uh, present a problem that is common for master builders, for, for uh, masons, and depict a solution that, uh, or present a solution for them that uh, is practical. Right? The best manuscripts were written, this, uh, the you know, the ones we know from, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16th century, 17 in this case, um, were done by people who usually were involved directly or, in the, or indirectly in, um, in the arts of making buildings. And in that period of time, which is something that is fascinating to me, is that definitely the connections between geometry and construction were very, very evident. And you couldn't think about building or designing without thinking with about two, the two of them, right? Building, geometry, and construction. So this manuscript is looking at the problem of a growing vault. The growing vault is a part of, a, 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 a part of the evolution, John, F John Fitchen uh, proposes part of the evolution of uh, the repertory of forms of construction solutions in masonry over time. And as we think about the growing vault, we start thinking about several constructive 
and geometric issues that need to be resolved. That's why Jose Gelabert is interested in, uh, in figuring out something that is very specific about the growing vault, which is the corner piece. So the growing vault's principle, as for, for those of you who uh, know a little bit about it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using this on and on off to, to present uh, some cases, but the growing vault principle is that you have one cylinder, right, in geometric shape, and then you have another cylinder on geometric shape, and the two of them intersect, right? with each other, they connect, they collide with each other, right? But in this moment of connection, right, if we think about two semicircular geometries, two cylinders of semicircular geometry, the shape that this uh, diagonal slice on the cylinder is gonna be, those of you who were in my construction class, remember? <laughs> well, no. It's gonna be a uh, ellipse, right? An ellipse is a difficult shape to deal with, especially at that period of time, right? So uh, in addition to, to, to this shape of the corner, what, we ha what happens when we intersect two cylinders, right, especially looking at masonry, oops, is precisely what we see here, which is a continuous vertical joint, right, between the two cylinder surfaces in masonry, which constructively creates problems, right? because you have a, a, a crack, a failure that is, or a, a, a place in the structure that is prone to failure. So what the, the issue here is to get to this point where the corner piece is one piece, right? But we are talking about elliptical shape, right? Right at the groin, right at this corner place, right? And, uh, and also think about during the, the, the carving process, the master masons, the master builders use templates, right? Templates that they will place on the stone pieces to carve out whatever it wasn't, wasn't needed and uh, to, to create the, 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 the piece with the proper shape and geometry. So it accomplishes both to uh, give form and shape to the structure, but also to um, to uh, constructively have a tight connection between the two surfaces, right? So that means that uh, this, this uh, Gelabert in his manuscript here, which uh, here is in the ancient Catalan, right? Describes how to create that template. And that's why one of the very, very first things that I started to do, this I'm talking about almost 20 years ago, right? When looking at the, uh, at, the, at the problem that Gelabert proposes, which is pretty much this series of steps to form the template, right, in, in, term, in creating a, 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 a grid and taking different dimensions within this grid to form the template. So what we see here is the groin vault and the template placed on the groin vault and what we see here is the template on elevation and plan, and because the template has to fold 45 degrees, 90 degrees to form this corner piece, right? Here, it, we're using the descriptive geometry. It's the, the folding element that we see it here in the true form and dimension, and we see the folded template here, and then rotated vertically to fit within uh, the piece, the very first piece on the, the stone. So the process of <clears throat> reading and then making the steps that Gelabert proposes is what these drawings are uh, uh, doing, right? All these different steps to form the template and to take each one, these are, this is the, 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 the text in Spanish, right? And then forming the template and then, as I mentioned, place it on the space. <laughs> And then an exercise, very, very simple, very rudimentary, as mentioned, I was talking about almost 20 years ago, where I uh, simulate uh, the, uh, the process of having a, a stone piece, then having the flat template, turn it, right, uh, fold it on the face, uh, cut the piece, then 
uh, start carving out the bossoir with the curvature of the uh, cylinders and then uh, turning the piece around to draw the other. That's why these two lines are four, right? To draw them through the piece and actually set the other template for the other cylinder intersecting. And then finally moving into the final shape of the piece, right? I have improved this method, <laughs> by the way, you will see. But I mean, generally speaking, that's the process, right? The piece, then fold it, the placing the template, folding it, and start carving out to get to that point where we see a core. We have a corner piece where the two cylinders intersect and we have this continuous, we don't have this continuous joint that creates this issue. Hellabert say, or this possible problem, a structural problem within the vaults. So Hellabert's proposition here is very effective for the master masons to uh, actually get here, as I mentioned, right? So, Ah, it's Coriel, El Escorial, which is one of the best buildings. And you learn, want to learn stereotomy, <laughs> you gotta go to the Escorial, right? <clears throat> it's, the, it's the peak of stereotomy in, in Spain. Uh, and generally speaking, I would say even in the world. And this is an, uh, it's a fascinating topic because we will see a couple of, <clears throat> a couple of examples here that um, uh, we find in manuscripts. This fair, uh, I'm going to talk about Van del Vira and Martinez de Aranda manuscripts, both from Spain. Uh, Van del Vira is, is a little earlier, 1580s. Uh, Martinez de Aranda is from the early 1600s. That's what we are seeing here, right? Martinez de Aranda. And this Q arch. This Q arch is a problem in stereotomy and building construction. And it appears in one of the earliest manuscripts that we have seen, uh, or that we have record of, which is the Villard of Honecourt manuscript from the 13th century, which I forgot to bring, but anyway. So here in this manuscript, we see a number of deep solutions that, uh, and curiosities that uh, Villard of Honecourt has for uh, different problems within uh, building construction back in the day in the 13th century. Uh, it's known or it's supposed that Villard was part of a, of a, of a crew or for a building team for some of the cathedrals uh, in Europe back in the 12th and 13th century. So he points here in this manuscript the issue of this cure skew arch, right? Why is this a problem from the, from the architectural, from the stereotomy point of view, from the construction point of view? Well, it's a, this is a situation in which there is an opening in the wall like the one we have back there, right? But instead of having the a threshold 90 degrees with respect to the, the wall, right, is inclined. Let's say that we have this is cute, right? They say we have another room over there, kind of diagonally, and we want to go in that direction. But in order to make the, 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 the opening, right, the, the, the structural element that is going to support the opening is going to be an arch, and to make that arch is what, uh, what it makes it difficult. So skewed arches look a little bit like this, right? Arches that are twisted, if you will, right? So what we see here, it's... Um, uh, a couple of solutions that uh, I explored. Uh, this one is by um, a, a Van del Vira. And I'm gonna go back again to the notion of the cylinder, right? Where we have a cylinder, right, that's gonna presuppose an arch. And the same thing, right? If we cut if we have, this is our cylinder, right? And if we cut it diagonally, right? Through a plane that cuts it diagonally, right? The shape of that intersecting plane that cuts diagonally, again, is going to be the same, an ellipse, right? But also the walls are not parallel to each other. 
are parallel to each other, but are, as I mentioned, are skewed. So what do we do here, right? If we conceive the opening, or what do the master builders do? What, if we conceive the opening as a cylinder, as it is presented here, right? This is the skewed arch, right, or the skewed wall, and then a cylinder that moves a, that a, a goes a, a, not perpendicular, but a perpendicular to the opening, right, to the, to the, to the span, then a, we are going to find the same situation where the arc is not gonna, not gonna be an arc, it's not gonna be semicircular, but it's actually going to be elliptical. And again, the problem here is not the shape of the ellipse, which is, I mean, come on, right? Ellipses are relatively common. But the problem is to find, you remember the ellipses have two foci, right? And in order to define the bossoirs and where the bossoirs go to form the structure is what is, makes it kind of hard for them to understand. Now there is a process or an alternative, which is an oval, which will be the basket arch, which I'm gonna explain a little bit later. But that's the issues that I'm dealing with. How do I make this geometrically correct, right? So Van del Vira, what he does is that he says, forget about having the cylinder, right, oblique to the uh, opening, meaning that the, the cylinder runs parallel to the walls. And let's make the, uh, an arc or an arch that is, a, is, a, is a, a line with the plane of the wall itself, right? Are you following this? Yes, yeah, okay. So let's do that and then it's gonna have two different, right, arches, which I'm gonna be able to control because they are a segment of a circumference, right? But when we see them, right, they are going to overlap. So <clears throat> they are going to be a not, they are not going to coincide, but they are going to be a little bit out of, you know, depending on how skewed the arch is and how deep the wall is, they are not going to be aligning completely. And so what it's going to create, right, is a situation in which <clears throat> the bed joints of the arch, right, follow this uh, geometry implant, these lines implant, they are gonna be planes, which is easy to carve. However, one of the rules for stereotomy and for arches to work is that the line of truss, meaning the forces, should be per are perpendicular to the bed joint, right? So if we have a, a, a piece of stone here and a piece of stone here against each other, the forces are gonna be perpendicular to the planes that make the bed joint. And the structural problem here is that why we have the truss to the void, right? If we do draw a perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular line to each one of these lines, right, which are the bossoirs in plan, we are gonna see the truss, meaning the forces are going outside of the arch itself. And in, it's not gonna be that big of a deal when we have a relatively thin wall, right? It's gonna be relatively manageable. However, <clears throat> it's not going to be precisely the optimal solution. That's why they are concerned about. Philibert Delorme in 1567 also proposes the same situation. We are seeing here the overlapping arches with the bed joints drawn for each one of them, right? And then therefore the, 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 the bed joints that are formed are planes that run across this, uh, across this thickness, right? which have these compromises, structurally speaking, right? But as I mentioned, they are feasible, they are doable, and that is something that was done for a number of times. Now, if we unfold, meaning developing, right, making it flat, we are gonna see that with more detail in future examples, in the next example, the intrados, meaning the interior part of the arch, we are going to see that what makes is not a, a, a straight line, it's gonna be a sinusoid. It's a, it's a shape, and we will see it with more detail, that has this type of, sh right? 
once we have, I'm exaggerating it, but that's the way it's going to look like. And therefore, <coughs> the implications for the carving rely on forming that double curvature shape that makes the adjustment to take the skew arch situation. So uh, these were more kind of analog explorations, right, where we went through the process of actually you know, with students of carving the pieces that we are using first a, a, a proposition by Van del Vira, what, where we have these two overlapping arches and the flat surfaces forming the bed joints. And then we look at a, a Martinez de Aranda, who is saying, you know what, forget about two arches overlapping. Let's just average the two of them, right, as they are kind of, a, are kind of off from each other. And then just make single bed joints across the entire width or thickness of the uh, arch itself. These implications are that you resolve the problem of the truss to the void because as you can tell, the bed joints in plan start to adjust to move to the point where they almost align, right? to the, each one of the abutments or the supports, right? They start moving, but the issue is that you know, we are not lo looking only at a sinusoidal surface inside of the intradus of the arch, but also twisted ruled surfaces, you guys in my construction class, right? Twisted ruled surfaces happening on the bed joints, right? And we went through the process of actually carving them. And as you can tell here how the arch Twisted, how the arch also, uh, bed joints are not as clear, but they also they, they have to twist. And those are, they are complicated, right, in, in the process of actually carving it. That's why this was a concern for the master builders. But what happens if you actually extrude that cylinder and think about, you know, a bridge, right? The same problem of the trust to the void is something that needs to be resolved. So one of the simplest solutions, right, is what is called the ribbed arch, which is gonna have individual arches that are going to be working pretty much as a regular arch, right, one after the other to form this uh, ribbed uh, surface, not a continuous surface, right, this kind of ribbed-like type of surface inside. It's relatively simple, but it's not very clean, right, from the stereotomic point of view, right? So the other method is what is called the logarithmic method that was developed in the 18th and 19th century, right? Where the sinusoidal curve that is, is developed uh, underneath this cylinder with oblique abutments, right, is divided evenly and taking the bossoirs, right, dividing the span or the length of the tunnel or the, of the, or the bolt, right, in equal number of uh, bossoirs, but once you unfold them, they start forming these curved shapes and then filling in within these lines in plan which become these curved shapes once you make the surface flat, right, with stones. Also kind of complicated, right? Again, remember that we want to avoid is that if this was a regular vault and a cylinder, right, we would have a viewman on one side, another viewman on the other side, and then a regular vault will solve the problem. But the fact that this is inclined is what makes it things kind of difficult. <laughs> so the one that we studied with more detail, right, was the helicoidal metal, met method, which is in this book by, by uh, Pilet, right? It was well known back in the day. He just represented here, right? And, it, and it's parts from the same proposition, right? But instead of looking at straight lines on plan, right, as the logarithmic method methods, uh, proposes, uh, this method proposes that we look at the sinusoidal surface unfolded horizontally and divide it into equal parts and then trace straight lines, right? And then we have an arch that avoids the trust to the void. The implications are that once you fold it back into a circle, each one of the surfaces 
is a helicoid, a DNA type of shape, right? A helicoid. And that what also presupposes is the complexities that come with the carving. This was done a number of times. This was pretty much the easy, but the cleanest solution. However, controlling the shape of feces, that was what made it uh, relatively complicated, right? Because the, 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 the bed joints had to follow this uh, ruled surface. So it's kind of a fascinating problem identifying that a uh, curvature, these are the bossoirs are uh, on different uh, projections, right? And exploring them from the point of view of carving them, looking at them plates, right? And uh, so we did this attempt, right? And it kind of worked, right? But we see here this, in this, in this uh, um, um, model is that we see the ceiling there, right? It's a ceiling there running, right? Intersecting diagonally with the walls. And the bossoirs are complete on the edge, avoiding that trust to the void situation. All right, another one that is was quite interesting for master builders is the irregular vault, right? We talk about the groin vault recently. We talk about two cylinders intersecting each other. We talk about, generally speaking, what we are seeing here is two cylinders with the same radii, right, intersecting to each other. But well, complications start happening when we have cylinders that intersect to each other that have no, don't have the same radii, right? But what happens if um, we have a vault that is not regular, right? The implications of actually this is Van der uh, drawing, right, of uh, groins or intersecting elements that are, don't have the same length. If we are looking at regular arches, right, the, uh, an arch of this uh, span is going to be taller than arch the shorter span. Is that correct? Right? And we talked about previously about two cylinders intersecting each other. Then these surfaces, especially the ones that are irregular, becomes something that is not precisely a cylinder. And then the preoccupation, the concern of the master builders is how the heck are we going to achieve that stereotomically speaking, right? How are we going to make the surfaces? So Van der Vira, of course, right, concerned about the same things, start talking about the, growth, the, the irregular bolts. And he is looking at a, 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 a ribbed bolt here as a possible solution, right? And then he starts looking at what happens if we look at a solution that is pure masonry, meaning there are no ribs, it's just a, 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 a uniform thickness, right? Not individual elements such as these ones on the ribs. And the implications that they have to have an arch, what type of arch will be that is gonna cover this span in comparison with this span and then have bed joints that run horizontally, right? Because, of course, this distance from this, bed, from this point to this point, this point to this point, is going to be larger than this to this, this to this, this to this, right? And making the adjustments. So the bed joints are not going to run, when you see them, are going to be straight lines on plan, but when you see them in elevation, they are going to be inclined lines, right? So those are the preoccupations they have. And then I run into this amazing building where you find the, uh, uh, the most, I think, uh, interesting irregular bolts uh, made in the, nine, in the 20th century uh, around here. It's got, it was Tabino Municipal Building uh, Vault in New York, right? where he had to, uh, Wastavino worked a lot with McKean, Maid, and White, and there was a, 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 a moment in time where uh, the contributions were so common that uh, he also worked with Cass Gilbert, right? We have Cass Gilbert buildings here, where he, he, they, instead of detailing what is what's gonna happen on the first floor, because these tile vaults were very efficient against a uh, fire, right? Where, where a fire proofing, uh, 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 building construction method, right? Uh, my Kimberly and White would say, was Tabino here, 
right? That will be the solution. Guastavino here. Guastavino will come with their solution, with the technique, with their materials, and will be a kind of design build type of enterprise, right? So, Aki, Mir, and White had to resolve a building which supports had to move around because there is subway underneath, right? So, all the, the, the position of the columns is completely regular. And then Guastavino is faced with this situation where he has to adapt the shape and twist and move the, the, the geometry of the vaults to make them possible, to make them buildable, right? And we see this very organic type of shape as we walk, uh, walk out from the, from the subway, right? And what we see here is a, is a, a, a beautiful example of, of, of a form finding that wasn't necessarily driven by, the, by creating form by the sake of form, but pretty much by resolving an issue that had, had to do with the structure and the geometry, right? So looking at Guastavino's uh, drawings, right, and the uh, implications that Van der Vira and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 is looking at here Right, and Gelabert, right, we look at how was Tavino resolved, right? And what he does is that in this case, 20th century, he's like, I'm gonna be looking at true ellipses to form this kind of longer arches, and that's what I'm gonna, it's gonna be my method, right? To stretch and to contract the arch depending on the span that they have to cover. Now, what I, uh, I have mentioned, and I did in, in, in this forum a few days ago, a few years ago, is that ellipses have all these complications that I just mentioned, and that the solution is not necessarily an ellipse, that draw, when the, what Stavino's drawing is actually wrong, what he's using is what is called a basket arch, which is an arch of three, or an arc of three centers that pretty much forms an oval or an ellipt, close to an elliptical surface, right? What we are seeing here in blue will be the ellipse, and what we see in red will be the basket arch. And that makes it manageable, because then you have one center, one center, and one center, and with tangent circles, you form the shape that you need, and that is what makes it possible, right? So the experimentation went through the process of actually the reverse engineering, looking at the photogrammetry to form surfaces, modeling, uh, uh, looking at the, the whole uh, uh, roof or middle intermediate floor as a system, and dissecting it, sectioning it, et cetera, et cetera, to identify the processes that uh, Wastavino might have used for the construction of these uh, vaults. Identifying the main or the possible the main uh, curvatures and elements that will help the masons to guide so they can achieve the geometries that they need to achieve. All of them based on this notion of using segments of uh, basket arches, not ellipses, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and um, to form, to create the, the main forms. But something that we need to consider and to keep in mind is that the spaces that happen between arches and the vault and the groins, and the, and the groins within this uh, vaulting system uh, are uh, surfaces that happen to happen, right? They are not fully controlled, especially with those stretching, moving, because all of them had to have the same height. So we started actually building a replica using the same Guastavinos system, I have done a few of those here in UT, I haven't done them for a while, right, testing it, and, you, and also identifying with the structural capacities of these type of structures. And this project that is what Elizabeth was talking about, right, the, the origin of the book, which is looking at two manuscripts that are the beginning or the seed for the study um, um, this is, uh, is based on ribbed bolts, right? Ribbed bolts are all these, these bolts that were used widely during the um, uh, uh, Gothic times, right? And this is a this is manuscript by um, Hernan Ruiz, 
where uh, he depicts in plan the, the, the ribs, and then he identifies each one of the ribs in its truth form and dimension. He's not making a vertical projection of this vault. He's actually looking at each one of these arches as they are, a, as they were flat, laying flat on a flat surface. And Van der Vida goes a step, a step forward and he adds thickness to the ribs and the same thing, right? Looks at each one of these ribs a, a, and arcs that form the geometry individually. And I took, this is one example, I took three of these vaults in Mexico and using this system to identify their uh, geometry is what uh, this study was about, right? And then, uh, uh, and then uh, explaining how is that uh, the master builders of the time not only looked at how they, they control the geometry, the, the similarities and differences that are have between these three different examples that I studied, but also the implications that we can see at the stereotomic level. Understanding that these are not only lines, but are a kind of a three-dimensional puzzle that has two purposes. On one hand is to create, of course, this beautiful ceiling, right? But also it has to perform structurally, right? It has to support itself. And it is amazing that a, 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 a structure such as this one that is about 170 of the span, the thickness is about 170, 170, 1 over 70, right, of the span, stone, by st stone with stone, no reinforcement at all, has been there in a seismic zone for more than 500 years, right? And I'm just gonna jump, this slide shows the, the process and that's what became an exhibition and the book that I was talking about. All right, so that's what I have for, I, for the things that I have been kind of looking around. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more, I know we are running short on time, uh, about uh, the, next, the next steps, right? Which is the Brian Dresdes and Miguel manuscript uh, which is of my interest, as you can tell from uh, what you have seen. And for this part, I wrote something. <laughs> so, Carpinteria de lo Blanco is a term used in architecture and carpentry to refer to constructing wood, uh, wooden roofs and ceilings. These structures use mudejar art embedded in the surface, and most were built in medieval and Renaissance times. The craftsmen an artist who built this type of structures were Muslim origin, were of Muslim origin, and used these construction methods for Islamic and Christian temples and buildings. This carpentry work was widely used in southern Spain and later brought to the Americas. The master builders that came to this continent in the 16th and 17th centuries brought their knowledge and applied their techniques when required for religious and civil constructions. Carpinteria de lo Blanco is recognized for the intricacy, for the intricate patterns that form the structures. What is fascinating is that the patterns follow rigorous geometric principles tied to construction principles. The constructive could not be, could not be understood without the geometric, and the geometric without the constructive. The results are beautiful ceilings and stable structures that are integral to the rest of the construction. <coughs> Within the study of, Carp of Carpinteria de lo Blanco and this type of structures in Latin America, no one can miss the name of Fray Andrés de San Miguel. His real name was Andrés de Segura de la Cuña, and he was born in 1577 to a low-income family in Medina, Sidonia, in Andalusia. He sailed to the Americas in 1593 at 15, returned to Spain, and remerged in the early 1600s as a Carmelitar friar in Mexico City, where he took the name of Andres de San Miguel. Fray Andres has been identified as a curious man, interested in different disciplines. He was a sailor, an architect, a hydraulic engineer, a mathematician, and because of his writing, also an author of treatises. He has been known for his passion for architecture, and it has been noted that he rejected a promotion with the Carmelitas 
uh, order because his inferior position afforded him time to reading and allowed him to be involved in the physical maintenance and construction of buildings. Historians link Fray the address uh, to the design and construction of the Convento Desierto in Santa Fe and the Monasterio in Querétaro in 1618. His involvement in developing the Convento de San Angel in Mexico City, built in 1615, seems to be relevant, so relevant that historians have considered this building his masterwork. His legacy not ended there. Between 1629 and 1632, he was involved in the construction of monasteries in Celaya, Morelia, Salvatierra, as well as a bridge over the Lerma River. The original copy of Fray Andrés' manuscript is part of the Benson Collection at UT Austin. For architects and historians, this is a very particular book because it's one of the very few that addresses the exercise of the discipline of architecture in colonial Mexico. The document comprises technical and architectural drawings of buildings and bridges, mathematical tables and illustrations, schematics of equipment such as pumps and pendulums and other drawings. This manuscript, like many others of, of the time, doesn't seem to be an organized written, rock, but written work, but rather a compilation of varied subject matters. The work projects his interest in the study and application of geometry, arithmetic, on building construction, and overwhelming motivation for his work. Other manuscripts were created in Spain around that time. Those include the manuscripts of Alonso de Vandelvira, Hernán Ruiz, uh, the Catalan Josep Gallabert, which I've been, been talking about, but those manuscripts focus on stone cutting techniques and mason reconstruction. Andres de San Miguel manuscript distinguishes itself because uh, a good part focuses on Carpinteria del Blanco, which is, as I stated before, finds its roots in Islamic Spain and deals with woodwork. By the way, this is a, a a uh, paper that I wrote with my colleagues in Spain, Enrique Rabasa and Jose Calvo, where we were looking at the manuscript, right, one day, and uh, all of a sudden we saw this page and we were like, wow, what, what is that? Well, it turns out that he also drew a uh, drawing for a rib bolt, right? And there is an article on that study and what he actually did and didn't do. <coughs> Because of its content, this manuscript is usually compared with Diego López de Arena's document, En Breve Compendio de la Carpintería de lo Blanco y Tratado de Alarifes, published in Spain in 1633. Both books address similar topics and aim to the public within the discipline of architecture or construction. In addition, both books were written to describe how wood building components were made and assembled. Enrique Nuere, a Spanish scholar known for his studies on Carpintería de lo Blanco, studied both Diego Lopez de Arena's manuscript and Fara Andres de San Miguel's manuscript. After this study, Nuere published a book called La Carpintería de Lazo, Lectura Dibujada del Manuscrito de Fara Andres de San Miguel. In this work, Nuere points out that although both manuscripts were written almost simultaneously on opposite shores of the Atlantic Ocean, each author provides a different approach to their writings. The one, on, on the one hand, Lopez de Arenas was a specialist who devoted most of his time to solving the problems that the carpenter faces when making his work. Therefore, his manuscript is the result of his experience as a carpenter. And on the other hand, Nore suggests that Fra Andres' manuscript shows the friar's limited knowledge about carpentry when he arrived in the America. Nore proposes that the, his knowledge was acquired from other texts preserved by the Carmelitas or from teaching received directly from carpenters during the construction works in Mexico. In the context of Islamic woodwork, specific methods used by Fernandez de San Miguel in the development and execution of some structures might be controversial. The extent to which the work of Fernandez de San Miguel's manuscript can be seen as a research rather than a summary of his professional practice as a carpenter is still in question. One thing is sure, Andres de San Miguel's manuscript is a valuable document that allows us to con contrast and reevaluate what we have learned from, uh, from other documents such as Lopez de Arena's writings. The manuscript of Fray Andres de San Miguel in the Benson Collection at the University of Texas at Austin is a Latin American jewel, and many of its secrets remain to be revealed. In this context, the work I want to develop aims to develop a new, aims to open a new chapter in these investigations. Digital technologies can be the door for groundbreaking research in the 21st century and help unfold selected aspects of the 17th century manuscript, 
especially those related to construction, geometry, and architecture. My work aims to open new paths for the contemporary visualization of this valuable document, exploring the implications, challenges, and opportunities that digital technologies offer to us so we can better understand the content of the manuscript and the legacy found in this way of making wooden roofs. And just quickly, I'm gonna go through initial work that I did with Andrea Alvarez, who got the Lilas Benson Digital Scholarship Fellow back in the day when we started looking at the manuscript and uh, one of the key components, which is called the the uh, the, the rueda de the, the lasso de ocho, means the the, kind of the wheel of eight, and how that is uh, uh, how that is created is, is, is presented in the manuscript, the implications that it has once this pattern starts spreading out to form panels of uh, of uh, of these ribbons, and how uh, also the manuscript points to different angles, right? And something that we have to point out here is the dimension, of the thickness or the width of the lasso or the ribbon, right? Meaning each one of these components, these little ones, and the relationships of the eight of wheel, a wheel of eight, right? Have direct connection with the amount, with the span that this structure can create, right? So all of that is interconnected. So those were the things that we were kind of dealing with and simultaneously looking at, okay, if identifying different possibilities for this paneling system, how will that uh, make sense? And started looking at the different patterns and moments. So there, those lassos, right, look continuous or are continuous, right, across the entire surface. And of course, the corner piece, which is one of the, most intricate ones, right? Or those that are cut diagonally. <laughs> Which is mentioned, of course, by Fray Andres because, right, he's like, okay, this is where issues might occur, right? So we need to provide a solution. So Andrea started kind of modeling, looking at the, the components, and the place where uh, we left it was, okay, we now see the, 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 this, this initial wheel of eight, a form as the uh, governing pattern in one of the proposals, not all of them, right, of uh, Fra Andres and Miguel. And uh, there was a, a, an effort to do a 3D print. Uh, however, uh, uh, it just stayed at that point where I think there are many other opportunities to keep moving forward. So um, what I would like to take this, right, of course, is to continue with literature review Document buildings in Latin America, some of the pictures that you saw are mine, but there are much more, especially Central America. I studied other solutions proposed in the manuscript. A deepened understanding of the ribbons structural work because uh, at this point we just understood the logic, but we didn't look at it from the structural perspective and how it adds to the overall uh, structure. Explore other digital, digital fabrication methods such as robot arms, I mean, 3D printing is something that I have done uh, in, I will say, in some extent, but would like to explore different possibilities. And uh, create larger models, uh, or scale, larger scale models for, for an exhibition, right? And explain the contents of the manuscript. And something that is also part of my dream here, right, is to bring this to, into a seminar, a studio class, where we can explore the contemporary uh, uh, design opportunities that can emerge from uh, this uh, manuscript and the work that uh, you can learn from it. So with that, thank you very much. I wanna stop here. We have a very few minutes for, for, the, for any questions. <laughs>